Welcome uh, to our symposium on tumor immunotherapy. I think it's really great to see everybody excited about this field. I can't say it's, it's really taken a long time, but I, I, I think I'm going to be daring and say I think we finally made it in terms of bringing immunotherapy to the field. It's, it's really exciting for me every day and every week. It seems like there's a new FDA-approved indication for various immunotherapy agents. I think one of the recent one is head and neck cancer. Uh, and, and really from the, the beginning of when I was studying the immune system, we really couldn't imagine that using checkpoint blockade would really have an impact on so many different diseases. And for me, it's just exhilarating to see the field move in such fashion and such with such momentum that um, we can host this uh, symposium so regularly and get a lot of you guys excited about this field. I think it's fantastic. Um, so thank you all for coming. I want to give special thanks to our keynote speaker, Dr. Mario Snall, for really taking the time to come up and hear what's going on in Toronto. And I think when Lillian really was brainstorming about this meeting, we really wanted to have a, a venue where we could share some of the things that are going on in Toronto and in Ontario and let the community know the kinds of things that we're capable of doing now in terms of clinical trials and rolling out new combination clinical trials. And so that's one of the major goals today. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Lillian to introduce the rest of um, the next uh, series of talks for this morning. Great. I guess I'd better introduce Pam. <laughs> She's our uh, director of our tumor immunotherapy program at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. I'm Lillian Sue. I'm a medical oncologist. I co-lead the program in the clinical aspects uh, with Pam. And I, again, I echo Pam's sentiments. It's, uh, it's, a great to, uh, it's a great day to see that kind of a turnout. We were oversubscribed, so we have people trying to sneak through the, the door as, as late as last night. So welcome. Um, just a, a house, some housekeeping comments. So today we have a very full day. So what we're trying to do is to have the sessions in each uh, in the morning where we have the speakers give, uh, other than the keynote, a short talk for about 20 minutes. We'll take one question or so at the, at the end of each talk if there's a burning one. But if not, we're going to save it for the panel where we're going to engage the audience for each of the, uh, the sessions in the morning. In the afternoon, we have uh, Ming Chao giving us a talk in the afternoon and then uh, subsequently a case discussion, uh, again, with uh, uh, audience engagement. So that's sort of the housekeeping uh, questions. And please turn your phone, including my new phone, on vibrate. Uh, and also, bathrooms are outside in that area. And if you need to take a call, please take it outside and, uh, and then come back. So without further ado, it, it truly is my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Mario Snow. I think many of you know Mario, he's, he's, a, he's a big name in the field and we want to open our inaugural meeting with a big name in the field. Uh, uh, Mario is from, from Yale, he actually uh, is the president-elect of the SITC meeting. Many of you know it's a, one of the most important meetings in immunotherapy. I told him I'm going to say he's the president-elect with no, no analogy to the other president-elect. <laughs> And uh, Mario spent many uh, years at the NCI as uh, the uh, um, uh, director of the uh, biological evaluation section. He leads a lot of the immunotherapy programs in the Yale uh, Cancer Center at this time. And he also is the co-leader and co-director of their SPORE program in skin cancer. And we all know he's a, a highly regarded expert in the field of immunotherapy. With that, we've asked Mario to give us a really an overview of the whole field in, uh, in terms of harnessing the immune system to fight cancer. Mario. Thank you, Lily, for that nice uh, introduction and for the invitation, and thanks to Pam. I've known the people here for many years. I'm, I'm a clinician, but I'm going to talk to you about the immunology of this, or at least the way I understand it, um, so that um, it'll provide a foundation for what hopefully we see the, the rest of the day today. Um, let me just start with the first slide. So um, this is familiar to many of you, but we, it's important to go through. I, you know, some, we, we know now that there are cancer cell antigens, that there are things that can be recognized by the immune system, primarily mutations, but there are other things like altered expression of developmental proteins or tissue differentiation proteins like melanocyte 
uh, antigens, and even stem cell drivers that can be recognized by the immune system. And in a process that we don't completely understand, the process of tumor development, those antigens somehow get into the body's professional antigen-presenting cells, the dendritic cells, and they're presented to T cells. And, and what's actually presented to the T cells is not the whole protein, but fragments of the protein that are processed and then put on the surface of the antigen-presenting cells on the MHC molecules, and that's what the, the T cells see. The T cell receptor is seeing just a peptide fragment on, on an MHC molecule on the surface of either the antigen-presenting cell or the tumor. Once those T cells become activated, they proliferate, somehow or another they get back into the tumor, and if, if the process goes correctly, theoretically, those T cells can secrete cytokines or directly kill the tumor cells, and hopefully you won't develop a tumor. Um, inflammation is important in development of tumors, so we know that during the course of tumor development, some patients develop T cell responses against their cancer, and so the question is, can we harness these T cell responses, which somehow at that point are not functional, in order to generate anti-tumor immunity. So just to, um, now to just put it on a little bit more of a molecular level, and it's much more complex than this, but um, if you just ignore the, 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 that part of the diagram off the side, what's actually happening is um, that an antigen-presenting cell um, is processing the, this protein into a peptide, putting on an MHC molecule and presenting it to a T cell. In this case, this is in the lymph node, and this is a naive T cell. When, like everything in biology, it's a complex process, and for this T cell to become activated, it needs a second signal, and that's usually a co-stimulatory signal, and so remember that word because you'll hear more about it later. And that co one of the co-stimulatory signals is provided by this molecule called B7, which binds to CD28 on that, on that T cell. And then that process leads to cytokine production, and all of this milieu uh, causes T cell activation in a, in a very sort of simplified way. But like everything in biology, uh, anything that the, where there's a positive effect, there's negative regulatory feedback. So when, when a T cell becomes activated, it brings to the surface of the T cell molecules, which can provide negative regulatory feedback. And one of those is CTLA-4. And CTLA-4 can actually bind to B7, the same molecule that was binding to CD28, with much higher affinity. So that turns off the T cell activation. But as I say, T cells also upregulate other molecules when they're activated, including this molecule, which you'll hear about a lot, called PD-1, very important molecule. So once a T cell is activated, it can get out into the, into the tissues and into a tumor. When it gets into the tumor, and this is the third panel there, the T cell, again, can recognize uh, a peptide either being presented by an immune cell within the tumor microenvironment or by the tumor itself sitting on an MHC molecule. When that T cell recognizes its, uh, its antigen, it produces cytokines like interferon gamma. And interferon gamma will actually upregulate the ligand for PD-1, which is PD-L1, either on the immune cell or the tumor cell. And that PD-L1, PD-1 interaction is, again, a negative regulatory feedback loop that inhibits the function of that T cell. So if we put this all together, it's a very complex process with positive and negative signals. What's important is that you can influence this process either by providing a positive signal, but also by blocking negative regulatory signals. For example, if you block CTLA-4, you might enhance T cell activation. If you block PD-1, you can enhance T cell function. So it's a lot more complex than this, right? And again, I, I present this because as to lay out for what's going to happen through the rest of the day, it's important to understand how, how complex the biology is um, in, in terms of trying to control this process. But if you look here, we, I've just talked to you about two signals, CTLA-4 and PD-1 as negative regulatory feedback to T cells. But you can see that in the context of either the interaction between a T cell and a, an antigen-presenting cell, or a T cell and the tumor, there are multiple both co-stimulatory, so stimulatory interactions, and inhibitory interactions. And I don't expect you to memorize this, 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 uh, this table, but I just want you to understand that there are many interactions occurring between that T cell and the antigen-presenting cell, which can influence the fate of that T cell. And in addition, the, there are many other things besides ligand receptor interactions that influence that T cell. So that can include cytokines, which we've talked about before, and also other things that go on within the tumor microenvironment or the lymph node, primarily the tumor microenvironment. So things like enzymes that 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 like IDO that can uh, <clears throat> metabolize tryptophan, 
or other kinds of cells like T regulatory cells, which their function is actually, actually to inhibit the T cell response, to inhibit other, other T cells, or in some cases, even the antigen presenting cells that are presenting antigen to the T cells. And there are other cells within the tumor microenvironment which have a, a negative effect on T cell function mild drive suppressor cells, macrophages, which can inhibit either by producing certain cytokines or by ligand receptor interactions. And even a substance like VEGF, which we're all familiar with for angiogenesis, can have very important effects on the immune system. And some of us believe that high levels of VEGF, for example, can inhibit T cell uh, ingress into the tumor, can inhibit T cell migration into the tumor. So interacting at any of these um, uh, pathways could affect T cell function and ultimately T cell immunity. So what does it actually look like when you look in the tumor microenvironment? So you, um, a simple thing to do is just simply look at, at, at slides, look at the immunohistochemistry, and ask whether there are T cells or not. And in fact, when you look at tumors and you do the immunohistochemistry, you can see T cells in some tumors. And this is data from my colleagues uh, at Yale, uh, 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 David Rim and Kurt Chopper, and also generated by Janice Taub at, at Hopkins, these slides are of, of lung cancer. But this is just showing you four types of lung cancer, including those that have no T cells at all, those that do have T cells, and in fact, some that have T cells but also have the PDL ligand 1. Remember, I, I, I said that PDL1 is a ligand for PD1, which inhibits T cells in the tumor microenvironment. And in some cases, the T cells are there in the tumor microenvironment, and PDL1 can be seen uh, on cells surrounding those T cells, probably induced by activated T cells that are producing interferon gamma that are causing the tumor cells and the surrounding immune cells to upregulate up this negative regulatory ligand. And so if you were going to classify it, there are tumors which have no T cell response, so you're going to have to do something different for those tumors. There are tumors that already have T cells there. You know they're already activated, but they're just being inhibited by this pd one PD-1 interaction. And there are tumors for which there are T cells, but they're not doing anything. And so you may have to use different approaches for each of those different kinds of tumors. And this is the most simplistic sort of classification that one can have for what's going on in the tumor microenvironment. Um, you can see, though, that in melanoma, which is a, the disease that I treat, many patients, 40 percent or so, 40 or 50 percent, will have tumors where there are T cells, and those T cells appear to be active, but just not yet completely functional, not functional. So let's take a deeper dive and ask what those T cells really are. And this is data from um, Elena Gross, who's now, unfortunately, in Barcelona. We wanted her to come to <laughs> Yale. Um, but um, this is work while she, that she did while she was in Steve Rosenberg's lab, just basically looking at the phenotype of the T cells that are actually there in melanoma. And what you can see is that many of the T cells express PD-1. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. But not only do they express PD-1, meaning that they've been activated, um, but they also express multiple other markers, which are markers of T cell um, antigen exposure and possibly of T cell exhaustion. Um, including LAG3 and TIM3. Some of them express activation, co-stimulatory receptors like 4-1-BB. Many of them, or most of them, are effector memory cells, meaning they're very far along in their differentiation. And many of them express multiple markers, uh, not only just PD-1, but they can express LAG3 and TIM3 all at the same time. And so if we just hit PD-1, for example, maybe we might need to hit some of these other uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, we call them checkpoint inhibitors, in order to get those T cells to function maximally in the tumor microenvironment. I'm going to skip this slide. This is just another way of looking at it using uh, CYTOF that we've been doing uh, at Yale. So let me add one more level of complexity to this. Remember the very first slide I told you that CTLA-4 was primarily working um, in the lymph node, that it was uh, 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 something that came up when naive T cells were activated um, that inhibited further T cell activation. But it's much more complex than that because when you look in the tumor microenvironment, you can actually find CTLA-4. This is intercellular staling of CTLA-4 in the T cells within the tumor microenvironment. And in fact, in some preclinical models, it turns out that when you inhibit anti-CTLA-4, it's really working either by eliminating some of these Tregs, which are express high levels of CTLA-4 in the tumor microenvironment, or maybe be acting on activation of some of these effector cells um, that are double positive for both PD-1 and CTLA-4 in the tumor microenvironment. So whenever we say that something is working in a specific place, 
CTLA-4 working in lymph node is more complicated than that. It may be working in the tumor microenvironment also when we block that pathway. And even when we say that blocking anti-PD-1 is primarily working by blocking a negative regulatory loop in the tumor microenvironment, it's more complicated than that because PD-1 may also be important in T cell priming in the lymph node. So whenever we hit any of these receptors, either in a stimulatory way or an inhibitory way, their effects are much more complex than what we normally put in our, our simplified uh, diagrams. So let me just say a couple more things about the function of these uh, T cells. So what are they really when they're in the tumor microenvironment? So first of all, are, are these PD-1 cells really exhausted? This is really uh, indicate uh, a marker of exhaustion. And in fact, this is again also work from, from Dr. Rosenberg in which he simply took T cells out of the tumor microenvironment and separated it to those that express PD-1 and those that did not, and then just stimulated them non-specifically to see whether they would produce cytokines. And without going through um, the complexities of these slides, you'll, you'll, if you'll take my word for it, the cells that are PD-1 positive, and you can see it in the, in the low panel C, the ones that are PD-1 positive, fresh out of the tumor, do not function that well. They, 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 they produce less cytokines than the PD-1 negative cells. So is that important? And which cells are the PD-1 positive cells and which ones are the, are the negative? Or is there a difference in what, what they're recognizing in the tumor microenvironment? And so um, this, in, this other experiment, which is very interesting, which tells us a lot, I think, about what's going on in the tumor microenvironment in melanoma, was to basic to show that this, is, this experiment now is just sorting out the PD-1 positive and the PD-1 negative cells. You can also sort them by whether they express TIM3 or LAG3. And then what you do is you, you separate them out and you culture them in interleukin-2 for about 15 days. And then you ask the question, which subset of cells are the ones that recognize the tumor? Which ones are the ones that are specific for the tumor? And it turns out that all the PD-1 negative cells in the tumor microenvironment aren't doing anything. They're just bystander cells. They don't recognize tumor. All of the antigen specificity is in the PD-1 positive population. And you can see it in this slide. It's a very complex slide. But across the top panel, those are the tumors. That's autologous tumors. The black bars are interferon gamma. And if you look at this very carefully, you'll see that only the PD-1 population that's grown out uh, are the ones that recognize tumors. So there's two important lessons from this. In melanoma, at least, and it's probably true in other tumors, the, the antigen-specific T cells, the ones that recognize tumor, are the PD-1 positive population or expressing other markers like LAG3 or TIM3. But the other important lesson is, is that they're not all exhausted, that when you can expose them to the right stimuli, like interleukin-2, after 15 days or so, they become functional again. And what this means is that you can turn on those T cells again. So what, if we can sort of put all this together, what we now know is that, at least in some subset of patients, they've primed. They've generated T cells that can recognize tumors. Those T cells are primarily PD-1, and in many of those patients, the T cells are there in the tumor. They're, 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 they're antigen-specific, but they're not functional. The ones that are PD-1 are probably just bystander cells. And we know that while they're in the tumor, right there, they're probably not terribly functional, but they can be reactivated again. And so that gives us the opportunity to intervene perhaps by giving cytokines or maybe blocking with anti-PD-1 to turn those T cells on again and generate anti-tumor immunity. So knowing this, knowing what we know, this little that we know about tumor immunobiology, what, what can we um, extrapolate from this? Well, we can intervene in a number of ways. If we know that there are antigens that can be recognized by T cells, we can give vaccines. We can try and generate anti-tumor immunity by taking those antigens and giving them back in a form that would make them, um, that would make them activate T cells better. And that, that could mean putting them in a vaccinia vector, and you'll hear more about, or an oncolytic virus or something like that. Or we can actually try and do something to the tumor inside the body to make it present antigen better. We can give cytokines like interleukin-2, and that works. In melanoma, 5 to 10 percent of patients will have wonderful responses, and many of those many of those 5 to 10 percent, so a fraction of those, will, will be cured of their cancer. And some of them are out now 15 years, so one out actually 35 years since her initial treatment, and, and still uh, remission, incomplete remission. You can provide co-stimulatory signals. So you can provide something that simulates 4-1-BB or OX40 or Gitter, and that has anti-tumor effects in animal models. 
But the, the, what, what so far had the most effect and what's really changed the world for immunotherapy is actually blocking the factors that, that block T cell function, blocking those inhibitory factors like CTLA-4 and PD-1, and I'll show you some data about that. But there are other things that we need to consider. I showed you a tumor that had no T cells in it, right? And so we need to ask the question, are those T cells someplace cells in the body, and is there a problem for those T cells getting into the tumor itself? Um, or another way we can manipulate the system is if the T cells are someplace there, we can take them out, and you'll hear more about this later, and expand the antigen-specific T cells to very large numbers and give those back. That's called till cell therapy, and that can also produce dramatic responses in a subset of patients. And then there are other approaches which um, we won't talk about today. We can give antibodies that, that kill by uh, complement-dependent lysis or by antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. They use NK cells or monocytes or macrophages, cells of the immune system to kill tumor cells. Or we can just give back NK cells, for example, or activate NK cells. Those are not, not T cells, but other kinds of immune cells that can kill based on ligand receptor interactions that can also perhaps in some cases mediate an anti-tumor effect. And when we activate innate immune immunity, we also enhance the ability to develop antigen-specific T cell responses in, in patients. So we've talked about this pathway, the PD-1, pd one pathway. PD-1 actually has two ligands, pd one and pd two. We, we don't know what pd two does, but we know that when pd one binds to PD-1, it inhibits T cell function. Um, Again, this pathway is more complicated, but most of the development has really been based on either blocking PD-1 or PD, uh, PD-L1. Um, and without going through all of the data, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of how effective this can be. Remember, I showed you all of this complex biology, and all we're doing is we're blocking one ligand receptor interaction, and we're seeing this kind of activity. So this is the phase three trial that was done of, of nivolumab, also called Optivo, also called anti-PD-1, versus decarbazine in patients with metastatic melanoma that received no prior treatment. And what you can see here is that the, um, the, the control arm is decarbazine, and this is unprecedented results. The one and two year survivals for melanoma here of 70% and two year survivals of almost you know, 55 to 60% are unprecedented. Some of these patients, after completing the treatment, remain remission-free and are probably cured of their disease. And you can see that there's a tail on the curve. And so what makes these immune therapies so exciting is that they produce, in, in some subset of patients, durable, complete remissions that don't go away once you stop treatment. It's not like targeted therapies. You don't have to continue giving the drug. Um, so if this were just melanoma, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We would be just like 10 years ago when we were mostly considered alternative medicine doctors. Uh, um, um, but in fact, this works in big diseases. So this also works in lung cancer. And these are phase three trials. Again, I, I just show some examples. This is true for pembrolizumab and, and, and will likely was true for atezolizumab also. But this is for nivolumab compared to docetaxel in the second line setting. And it showed a survival advantage, as you can see here, for both non-small cell uh, for non-squamous cell carcinoma, so adenocarcinomas, and for squamous cell carcinoma, comparing to docetaxel. This is now in the second line setting. So now improving survival in a major disease. It's also true in kidney cancer. This is a second line study of nivolumab compared to everolimus uh, in patients who've progressed off a VEGF receptor inhibitor, again showing an improved survival for nivolumab compared to everolimus. This is in the second line setting, not an overly dramatic result, but again, it's showing a survival advantage um, in this setting. And this is a study of pembrolizumab in patients who have mismatch repair deficient cancer. So these are uh, patients who, because of their molecular abnormalities, have a high number of mutations and therefore are likely to be much more uh, uh, responsive to immune therapies. And in this case, the response rates in, 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 this, in these MMR deficient cancers was up to 60%. So this is a subset of colon cancers and a few other epithelial uh, malignancies. And now if you take a look at all the tumors in which anti-PD-1 or anti pd one is effective, it's remarkable. Um, it's approved in melanoma in the US, it's approved in renal cancer, it's approved in non-small cell lung cancer, all on the basis of randomized trials that show improvement in survival. There are randomized trials now reported in head and neck and gastric cancer that show improvements in overall survival. I've shown you an activity in 
mismatch repair deficient tumors. Atezolizumab and anti pd one is approved in the U.S. for bladder cancer. Um, it has enormous activity in Hodgkin's lymphoma in the 80 to 90 percent range. In Merkel cell cancer, a rare tumor, but still response rates that exceed 50 percent. Uh, the, the number of tumors in which this has shown activity is amazing. This is more active than docetaxel or cisplatinum. Now, not everybody responds, and in some of these tumors, the response rates are only 20 percent. But the, the breadth of activity is amazing, and this is what's driving the field forward and, and driving all of this uh, investment uh, in development of immune therapies. And just to point out that um, it's not just anti-PD-1. Um, there are two anti-PD-1s, but there are many more being developed. Uh, tezolizumab, which is an anti-PD-L1, the ligand for PD-1, is also approved in the U.S. There are two others that are being developed heavily, but I think there's probably uh, more than 10. If you look, almost every company is developing one of these agents, either to use alone or in combination with other uh, compounds. There are a few tumors where this has not shown a great deal of activity. For example, mismatch repair proficient colon cancer, it's not very active. Myeloma and pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer so far have not shown major activity for this class of drugs. So um, why, what causes resistance? So um, if we go back again, why would someone not respond to these drugs? And that's going to be the focus of development, I think, over the next several years. So one possibility is that the tumor just can't be recognized. So it either doesn't have a lot of antigens or, or it can't present antigen anymore. One possibility is that molecular biology of the tumor, signaling pathways, or for other reasons, um, it, 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 it blocks antigen presentations. The antigens are there, but somehow or another, the, the dendritic cells that need to present those antigens can't be activated, can't take up antigen and present those antigens to T cells. It's possible that some tumors have developed a biology that excludes T cells from the microenvironment. So they, they have a way of keeping those, those antigen-specific T cells out. And there are some things in the literature now that suggest that that could be true for a subset of patients. It's possible that the T cells are there, they're present in the tumor, but there are just not enough of them. Or the breadth of activity, the number of antigens they recognize enough, or the, maybe even just the affinity. They're there, they can recognize antigens, but they're not very strongly uh, uh, their, their affinity for that peptide MHC complex is not strong enough to generate a strong enough immune response. And finally, and, and this is where anti-PD-1 works, is that they, the, they're there, they can function. Um, they're functionally blocked, but it's not enough to block PD-1. You may need to block something else in order to get those T cells more fully functional or give them something else to really uh, uh, work well enough to get rid of that, that tumor mass. Now, I'm going to talk about one area of combination just very briefly, um, which is a combination of anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4 to show you one example of how combinations can address uh, these potential mechanisms of resistance. Anti-CTLA-4 was around before anti-PD-1. It's active in melanoma, not nearly to the degree that anti-PD-1 is. It does different things, as I showed you before. When you put these two in animal models, just like everything else you put in animal models, when you put A plus B together, it works. Um, and anti ct 4 and anti-PD-1 were the first agents were available. It showed substantial synergy. In some animal models, this is data that was provided for, by Alan Corman, who actually was a major driver in development of these drugs when he was at Matarix and now at, at Bristol. Um, so on the basis of these data and the fact that these were really the, the two main agents that were available at the time, we conducted a phase one trial of these two agents together in which we took um, the dose of ipilimumab, which was then approved, and kept it at its dose of three mg per kg, and then we added nivolumab, the anti-PD-1, in, 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 uh, in, in a dose escalation manner. And I'm not going to go through the results of this trial. What we showed is that um, this was very active. There was a lot of toxicity, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the activity was enough that, that it generated interest in moving this further along in, in development. One of the things that we did in, in that trial, and this is done by uh, the investigators at Kavita, Dadapkar, and Madhav at, at my institution, is they basically looked at um, gene expression of T cells in the peripheral blood and monocytes separately with anti-PD-1 alone, which we had done uh, earlier, anti c 4 and a cohort of patients had been done earlier in the combination. And when you put two drugs together, they clearly do something different. This is gene expression 
in, in T cells and monocytes, the, uh, where you see B up there, the first one is T cells, the second one is monocytes, and clearly when you put two drugs together, you get a whole different pattern of gene expression in T cells, and, and this suggests that A plus B is not just A plus B, it's some, some sort of an interaction that creates a different drugs when you put two things together, and that adds to the complexity of developing these drugs in the clinic. But clearly, it's not just A plus B, these two things do something different. And, and even when you look at cytokine production in the peripheral blood, there's a whole different pattern, or at least more of these cytokines produced when you have the combination compared to either single agent alone. Now, I just want to make a point about toxicity because we may not discuss that a lot, but it's really important. When you put two agents like this together, you get a lot more toxicity. So anti-CTLA-4 produces autoimmune toxicity, immune-related inflammatory reactions in almost every organ. And when you put the two of those drugs together, you markedly increase the number of adverse events. And about 50% of patients who get this combination will have grade three, four autoimmune adverse events. This is a list. It's primarily skin, GI, endocrine, um, liver, but it can affect any organ. We've learned how to manage these side effects with the institution of steroids when they occur or secondary immune suppressive agents, but some people can get very, very sick with these drugs, and so we shouldn't take the toxicity lightly. And as we've had more and more experience, now we see some very bizarre and unusual and sometimes even life-threatening events when you put these drugs together, even anti-CTLA-4 by itself. And this can include systemic inflammatory syndromes, uh, bowel perforations, induction of diabetes, um, debilitating arthralgia, CNS uh, toxicities. There's a recent report of fatal myocarditis. So when we deal with immune therapies, these are not non-toxic drugs. They induce, because we're, we're, we're it, releasing the inhibition of T cells that are there that might be auto-reactive against normal tissues, you can see some very severe toxicities, which fortunately most of the time can be controlled at that point by using steroids. And often when you do that, you don't, if they're responding, their tumor is responding, you don't get rid of the tumor response. So what's the activity of the combination? This is just in melanoma, and I just put up this slide. It's a complex slide, but I just want to focus you on the, on, on survival. And in melanoma, the anti-PD-1 drugs I, I, I mentioned to you earlier by themselves in the frontline setting are producing survivals in the range of 50%. When you give IPI and anti-PD-1 together, when you give those two together, at least from one of the preliminary studies, it looks like you're adding another 10, 15% uh, to survival at two years. This is based on our phase one data and also on a randomized phase two trial. And although we don't have mature data on survival, it's very likely that the combination, which not only improves response rates, not only improves progression-free survival, will also add to the survival in melanoma. And just to give you an idea about the impacts of these drugs in melanoma, when I started treating melanoma many years ago, the expected five-year survival rate was in the range of five to 10%. I think with the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab, if we can extrapolate from the current data, we could be in the 45 to 50 percent five-year survival range, which is really an amazing advance um, for, for these drugs, and it shows the power of, of, of both single agent and combination therapy. And I'm just going to, I may not have enough time to go through all these, so I'm going to go very quickly. This is just a, a patient that we treated who had a huge mass who was unresponsive to targeted therapies and radiation. Her, her lesion, this huge mass that you see there, uh, almost a complete response within 12 weeks. This is a patient with an anal mucosal melanoma that received a single dose of treatment because she developed uveitis. We had to stop the drug. She, she had a complete remission of multiple sites of disease. And then she recurred two and a half years later with a new gastric mass. And this is an important aspect of these drugs. We reinduced her. With ipinevo again, she did not develop recurrent uveitis, and that gastric mass went away, and she's again in complete remission. So these drugs can work even a second time uh, if, if patients have recurrence. And this is another example of one of the aspects of this drug. This is a patient here you can see that um, was receiving drug, and the, the slides on the, um, on, the, on the, I guess, to my right, uh, show response in thousands of pulmonary lesions. But at the same time that he was responding, you can see that at week 13, he developed two new brain metastases. And we just left these brain metastases alone and just followed him. We didn't treat them with gamma knife radiation. So this is a, an example of pseudo-progression uh, in the brain, and we left it alone. And over time, these brain uh, lesions went away without any radiation. They went away on their own. So these are unique drugs, and how you manage them in the clinic, I think, is important and will be discussed later on today. 
Um, Ipinevo is not just going to be active in, in, um, in melanoma. It's also uh, shown increased rates of response in kidney cancer, and those phase three trials are completed. And there's some evidence, even in non-small cell lung cancer, that the combination now used in different doses and schedules to reduce toxicity can still improve activity. And in this case, this is data presented from Matt Helm at ASCO, the response rates in lung cancer, at least in, in, in not uh, uh, concurrent cohorts, but in, but in, in comparing to uh, retrospective cohorts, doubled the response rate in the frontline setting for non-small cell lung cancer. So um, in the last couple of minutes, I just, just want to go back to talk a little bit about how we're going to move forward. So I showed you this about the different kinds of tumors and thinking about different approaches that one might need to take depending on the biology of the individual tumor. And one of the problems that we have is that we don't really understand the biology for every individual and every tumor. So how we approach them is at this point somewhat empiric and in fact, I would say somewhat chaotic. Because, um, as I showed you before, there are different mechanisms of resistance, and we can't really identify for an individual patient what signals that patient's going to need in order to get their tumor to respond if they don't respond to anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 in combination. You don't need a, a checkpoint blockade for every patient. We know in melanoma that there were patients who responded to IL-2 and anti-CTLA-4. We weren't blocking PD-1 in those days, and they could still have an effect. And you'll hear later on today about adoptive cell therapy, which can give very high rates of response in melanoma, even without a checkpoint inhibitor. So again, we, we don't really understand the optimal signals that each patient needs in order to get their tumors to regress. But there are lots of options. I showed you this before. And if you now come here and look at all the things that are being done in the clinic, it is remarkable the number of combinations and the number of agents that have come into the clinic over the last three or four years. So if you just look at PD-1 and what you can combine with or things that you can combine together, I'm going to go very quickly through a list of agents so that you have a sense of the breadth of activity in the field. You can use other checkpoint inhibitors, and almost all of these agents are in the clinic, LAG3, TIM3, TIGIT, B7H3, B7H4, Vista, CD200, CCAM, CARE. All of these are being uh, put into the clinic alone or in combination with anti-PD-1. Drugs that affect monocytes and macrophages, it tries to, to, to restore the, uh, a, a more normal function to these cells within the tumor microenvironment that might lead to either more antigen presentation or a more favorable environment for T cell function things that inhibit T regulatory cells, things that block inhibitory cytokines, things that block metabolic inhibitors of T cell function, like the adenosine 2A receptor. So in hypoxia, you generate adenosine, and adenosine binds to T cell receptors and, and basically inhibits T cell receptor function or T cell receptor signaling. And so blocking those pathways may help T cell function in the tumor microenvironment. And other things like IDO inhibitors, um, which, which, which are now being combined and actually already is in a phase three with pembrolizumab. And then that's just blocking negative regulatory checkpoints to T cells. There are all things, kinds of things that you can do to drive T cell function. So um, things that allow T cells to get into the tumors, for even anti-VEGF is now a, a, an immunologic agent in, in, in our view. Um, vaccines. Um, um, uh, things that, that hit dendritic cells, that activate dendritic cells so you get better antigen presentation. Oncolytic viruses, sting agonists. I could just go on almost for another hour with all of the different approaches that one can use to stimulate T cell function or expand T cell function that you would now combine with agents that block inhibitory factors in the tumor microenvironment. And at the last meeting, at the SITC meeting, um, Dan Chen and, and R. Melman put up a list of 800 combination clinical trials that are ongoing around the world today. How we're going to sort all this out, I think, is the challenge for the field over the next few years. And um, I'm going to end with just this slide. Um, you know, for any individual patient that comes in, um, what happens to them is influenced by their genetics, their lifetime exposure, maybe their microbiome how that cancer developed, the mutations that developed, that tumor host relationship that developed over the years. And that creates this very complex tumor microenvironment. It's going to be really important for us to really understand what's happening at a very basic level in that tumor microenvironment. What T cells are there, their affinity, their breath, uh, how exhausted they are, um, what the, the tumor is presenting, everything else that's going on in that microenvironment in order to rationally develop combinations in the future. And I know, and I just spoke with Pam here, and I'm, I'm very 
you know, happy to hear that her lab is working on trying to figure out these factors so we can be more rational about how we develop these therapies in the future. What I'm hoping for is that we will eventually be able to phenotype every individual patient in terms of what their tumor has in the microenvironment. So we'll have 50 different phenotypes. Maybe we'll be able to match that to animal models. We'll be able to test those concepts in animal models, go to humanized mice, maybe go back and rationally deliver these agents to, to patients. So in conclusion, and I may have taken a little more than my time, um, um, immune therapies based on PD-1, PD-1 blockade are active. They're active across uh, a broad range of tumors. They provide meaningful benefit. You can get durable responses in a subset of patients. That's what makes these therapies so exciting. They're thousands, well, almost a thousand combination approaches, but we need substantial advances in the understanding of the tumor microenvironment to, to select the best treatment. And, and we need to address, and this is something that we didn't talk about today but may come up later, practical issues such as the cost of these therapies and the combinations and how long to give these treatments, which we haven't resolved at all. With that, I'll stop and thank, thank you for your attention. Turn on the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. That's a great opening, a mix of science and clinical, and, and really sets the stage, I think, for today. We have time for some questions. Um, I can see that uh, Dr. Takmak is already sitting, standing there, <laughs> waiting for uh, the first question. Please identify yourself, Tak. I, I know this is going to be a hard question. I just know. <laughs> I'm Mark Davis from Stanford, yes. <laughs> Mario, there was a brilliant talk. You covered basically the waterfront and very insightful. I, 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 was, I was actually secretly taking pictures. <laughs> but there is one anomaly in all these Hodgkin lymphoma. They have no neoantigens. Even MXC class 1 is not on because both beta 2 microglobulin allele has been mutated. What's going on there? Okay, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll answer it with I don't know because I, but I, I actually, I spoke with Dan Longo who is, you know, the, when we wrote that editorial for the New England Journal, he asked me to write it. And I asked him, Dan, how is it possible that Hodgkin's disease responding? No one has ever documented that these CD4 cells that are surrounding the Hodgkin cells are actually antigen specific. Um, and he didn't have an answer. And maybe we just haven't looked the right way. But I, I wish I had the answer to that question. I tried to explore it, but I, I don't think anybody really knows. Maybe, maybe you have a hypothesis so I'd love to hear. I have no hypothesis. I need samples. Do you have samples? <laughs> I, 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 fortunately, I don't treat Hodgkin's lymphoma okay. patients, but, but I... <laughs> if you do. Because the, uh, the, 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 the tumor cells have mutated both copies of beta-2 microglobulin, so by definition, they cannot even present MXC class 1 antigens. So why the heck do they, are they actually the best responder? Well, maybe they, they, there's class two and maybe the CD4 cells are, I, I don't know, maybe it's an innate immune response that's being activated that's present within all that sea of CD4 cells that are around. But I, I actually think it would be a great experimental question and I, I, it hasn't been addressed. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? So let me ask a question that you've mentioned about really 800 plus trials ongoing, and I think currently what we're seeing is that it's, it's, it's hard to imagine all this kind of data being sort of learned in totality, that everybody's doing a lot of stuff on their own, and do you think there's sort of a room for, like we have genome data commons for genomic data, I think this is time to really start building an immunology data commons to, to learn quickly. I, I, I was just having this discussion. With, with, with Pam. Oh, well, I should have eavesdropped. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> just, just before the meeting, and, and I, I, I first, I, I think we need a TCGA, and, I, and I'm not the first one to say this, for the tumor microenvironment. We really need to understand what's there, what signals are there, so that when a patient comes under the trial, it, it, we, 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 can, I, we, we can actually have appropriate biomarkers, but the biomarkers have to be based on an understanding of the actual tumor immunobiology, which I don't think we know, and, I, and tumors are different. So the answer to your question is yes, it would be great if, if the NCI or, or Canada now, because the, maybe the USA won't do it anymore, but uh, <laughs> um, would, would sponsor a, uh, uh, some sort of a TCGA type project uh, for this. Um, but if we don't have this, it'll be chaos, because if you really suspect that there are 10 different mechanisms or 15 different mechanisms of resistance, and you do these trials in unselected populations, 
it's garbage in, garbage out. We won't ever see the signal of activity. Uh, that was a great talk, by the way. Um, Please I noticed that, that you yourself. barely <clears throat> touched upon um, genetic engineering-based approaches. It was mostly interventional or pharmacological type uh, approaches. Do you believe that the body possesses um, the potential for antigen specificity in all cases so as to achieve complete remissions and on, on a sustained basis? No, not in, not in all cases. I mean, I, um, um, there are some tumors I don't think we'll be able to address at all. There are tumors. So Steve Rosenberg's work, I think, is really interesting in that he looked at 20 or 25 consecutive epithelial malignancies, and he found antigen-specific T cells in most of those patients, but they were rare. And these are tumors with very few mutations. So it may not be enough to give checkpoint inhibitors or co-stimulatory agents. In some patients, we're going to have to actually isolate out those antigen-specific T cells and expand them to large numbers, or isolate out the T cell receptors and put them in peripheral, into peripheral blood lymphocytes. And I think some patients may be addressed by CARs. Maybe we won't. Maybe there are abnormalities of expression of glycosylation or things that are pressed on the tumor cell surface that we can use to uh, uh, for for CAR T cell therapy. But, but they may not respond to vaccines or checkpoint inhibitors or the traditional approaches that we're using now. Right. At so least that's my, my, did I answer that? Uh, yep, absolutely. The future would probably be a combination of both approaches. We need all of them. We need all of them. I didn't have time to address it, but there are other speakers today that will talk about those, those, uh, okay. those therapies. Anna? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this great talk. I'm Anna Spravico, one of the... Um, uh, uh, physician here at Princess Margaret. Um, I have uh, actually a very clinical question. You show some impressive results on patients with melanoma in the combination treatment. You show the uh, side effects, the severe side effects. You also show that this patient can be managed and then they can be rechallenged with this combination. Um, can you comment how you approach a patient that comes with an immuno, um, an autoimmune disease but does have a life-threatening conditions such as uh, melanoma and so what do you do? Because often these, these patients are, uh, we know, they are excluded from, uh, from clinical trials. So, and this, these uh, drugs are becoming, you know, in the market, they are, they are approved. How do, you, how do you manage these uh, clinical conditions? So it, it does depend a little bit on the autoimmune conditions. So if it's autoimmune thyroiditis, I don't care. Um, but I've treated patients with multiple sclerosis, for example, with uh, not concurrent IPI and NEVO, but sequential IPI and, and uh, so anti-PD-1 and, and, uh, and anti-CTLA-4, actually the reverse sequence. And I didn't make her MS worse. I mean, there's actually a publication now that was driven by a group of investigators, I wasn't one of them, where they collected retrospectively data on using of anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 in patients with autoimmunity. And it looks like you can get away with it in most patients. My, my clinical impression is that some of these patients actually respond better than, than patients who don't have autoimmunity. So given the risk-benefit ratio, I bite the bullet, I explain the risks to the patients, and I go ahead and give them the checkpoint inhibitors. I tend not to give them the combination. I tend to go with either anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4 alone at this point in time. It was a great question. Great. Thank you. Let's uh, thank Mario again for a great overview. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you.